what's really the difference of design-driven versus technology-driven innovations? And I think uh, what we really discussed was to say um, design innovation is more than just technology. It's also about how you create and capture value. It's how it's the usefulness of the product or the service that you provide. So basically, design really goes beyond form and function, which many companies are pretty much focused on, but also to go beyond that and think about the usefulness of a product. Uh, it's the thin line between uh, what the customer's willingness to pay is going to be and how much they're going to pay for a product or service that you provide. So we see design really, especially when you talk about technological innovation, as really a central aspect of, of, of how you create value for the end users, but also how you uh, capture that value. Uh, many times we've seen uh, technologies that really drive you know, the different types of innovation, but then there's always a disconnect between the end user and what they really need. So really design is about having designing products and services with the customer uh, in mind, really being very customer centric in the processes that you onboard, the entire customer journey that you take in really creating a product and a service. Yeah, it's been having the customer in mind. So when we look here in Rwanda, um, uh, what are some of the things that are being done in order to change the mindset of the people when it comes to technology? Uh, some, I mean, beyond the general awareness and sensitization that happens uh, when a product is created, whether it's both from the public or the private sector, I think it's the constant refinement of those products and services. And I'll give you a typical example to really um, uh, explain what I'm trying to say. When we when we, when as a government we had the intention to put all government services online on Irembo, we had pretty much more than 80 services uh, online. Today you can find them online. But now more and more we are seeing the team going beyond simply automating the existing processes of providing a service to actually saying, do these, process, do these processes create and capture value for an end user? So today when you go on Irembo, you'll see that um, there are three services that have really been refined. Uh, this is the birth certificate, the death certificate, and marriage certificate. What happens is that when you get onto a Rainbow platform, you can apply for a birth certificate and you'll get it in the convenience of your home and whatever location you're in. It's a bit different with the other services, but the idea is that this, th this type of um, you know, service delivery where one doesn't have to move or even visit an office for a service is cut out completely. And so that is really the difference between you have fully automated your service delivery process to now you're thinking, as an end user, putting myself in the shoes of the end user, what, uh, what would define uh, the right kind of service delivery that is, that, that is technology enabled? And so I th just to respond to your question in a few words, it's really that constant refinement of the products and services that one creates to respond uh, to the end user needs. When we come to tech startups as well as funding, you know, what are some of the policies that uh, local banks are implementing in order to facilitate um, uh, the funding? The current financing institutions, banks, uh, are pretty much uh, targeted and designed for uh, traditional industries. And um, that's why as a government there was um, a decision to really co-create a fund with a venture capital firm that really allows to um, provide the right type of financing to scale tech businesses. However, that fund is targeting the um, what we call growth stage uh, financing. We still have a gap when it comes to seed and pre-seed financing. By that I mean when you have a young innovator that just has a very good idea and they need to prototype it, design it and develop it, there's not sufficient financing instruments in that space uh, because pretty much it's a risky stage of any business and so the tendency globally is that you'll find governments and development partners bridging that gap, but then we need to see more and more and more, uh, you know, financing really provided for seed stage, uh, uh, for seed stages of any business, because that's the only way we are going to create a massive pipeline of innovators within the economy. And so we've done that by triggering the Rwanda Innovation Fund, but also putting in place what we call technical assistance financing that really supports uh, incubators and accelerators ac across Kigali to really say what are some of those financing needs that you have, how can we you know, come in and support building, because it's really about building the capabilities and helping them to prototype and move into the next growth stage. 
but it's not enough. There's still room to really onboard as many partners that are looking to provide that, that type of financing that is very specifically targeted to tech firms. Because most of the tech, some of the innovators are young people. They don't have collateral to put for a bank. And so we really are uh, uh, really looking out and, look, and keen on partnering with anyone that is, is, has an interest in really financing uh, tech businesses. Yeah, you've mentioned on creating innovators. When you look at our education system here in Rwanda, it's a curriculum that, was, that has been in place for many years. Now we are in a digital era. So what are some of the things that the government is planning to do in order to link with the education that is received in schools as well as the current market demands? So for a start, I think as we've moved away from the traditional curriculum into a competence-based curriculum, and I think that is really a good step uh, going forward in really overhauling uh, the curriculum development process. Very specific to engineering skills and tech skills, I think what we are trying to work together with the Ministry of Education and different partners is how do we have uh, very practical manners of, uh, of, of embedding these skill sets on, 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 on the students that are coming through our education system. A case in point is the Rwanda Coding Academy that recently started on 4th of February um, in Nyabihu, which really the target is we've brought in 60 students that are passionate about coding and it's a bridge program where they're going to, the next three years, which is the typical senior four to senior six, uh, um, you know, space is they're going to really be provided with very targeted um, software engineering uh, classes and also with very practical skills. So what that helps us is that after the three years, someone could choose to get into the workforce or to continue their education with the university. Either way, this program allows them to, you know, to, 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 to choose what they are very passionate about. And so I think beyond the traditional education system, we're going to put in place more um, unique uh, education programs that are really targeted towards building the kind of capabilities that we need for the digital era. Um, but that's just on the tech side. Even when it comes to you know, business management courses or any other skill sets, it's still, we need to be able to create, to, we need to be able to create skills for the future. 